All right, welcome everybody to lab one of the Entrepreneurship 2022. We're just going to wait a moment for everybody's audios to connect. I think there's a lot of people entering the room at the moment and we just want to make sure that everybody can hear. So I'm just checking out that all these audios are connecting one by one. But if you can hear me, welcome. It's fantastic to have so many of you back with us. If you haven't met me before, you will hear from me in a second. We're just waiting for all these audios to to join loud and clear from Von Landen. Oh, Von Landen, how's it, buddy? Cool. Um, I think waiting room, you want to just turn off that waiting room and we're good. So welcome, guys. Uh, thank you all for joining us today at Lab One of the Entrepreneurship Avenue 2022. My name is James, and if you don't know who I am, I am your friend and guide for today and for the rest of the Avenue journey. Now, before we get going, and before I tell you a little bit more about what's going on, just a few technical things that we need to sort out. Can you all please rename yourselves to have your first name and your last name so that we know who attended today for our um, participation points that you all get for joining the labs? And the second thing is, if you want to see me on full, as well as the slides, as well as my be the beautiful speakers that are going to be joining us tonight, put it on side-by-side -side, uh, mode, speaker side-by-side, -side, and you will be able to pull that across and then you can have me talking and you can see the slides and it's going to be amazing. So again, welcome everybody. I want to tell you guys um, a little bit about how amazing the kickoff was. Thank you guys, everybody who had joined us. It was really fantastic. Like a big shout out to everybody that came, that brought that energy. You guys really inspired me. I hope that you felt inspired by the kickoff as well, that you guys got connected, that some of you are potentially forming teams or so I've heard. Um, I met a lot of really epic people and it was really, really a blast. So thank you guys for joining us. Really, my heart was warm and full afterwards and I think a lot of my team felt the same. So thank you guys. Now, I want to tell you guys what Entrepreneurship Avenue is about because I know that there are a few people here tonight that didn't join us for the labs. And the main, you know, the main motto of Entrepreneurship Avenue is entrepreneurship is for everyone. Right? Anybody who wants to be an entrepreneur can become an entrepreneur. All it takes is an idea, hard work, determination, and above all, passion. Remember that entrepreneurship is not exclusive. It's not saved for people with special connections, for people with money. It's not saved for people who study business, right? You just have to put your mind to it. You have to want to do it, and you can. All right, and that's what we're trying to do here at The Avenue. We're trying to give you guys a space where you can practice entrepreneurship in a safe playground environment, where you don't have to worry about the risks involved, where you can try things out, where you can learn, and where you can, more importantly, collaborate with people from different disciplines, get to know one another, and you know, figure out what it's all about. Now, um, I want to recap what exactly we'll be doing at these labs. Today is lab one, the fundamentals. Right? And this is going to be all about problems and solutions. We're going to be hearing from some amazing speakers today and we're really just trying to give you a foundation about what you can learn. Then when we move on to lab two, that's when things get a little bit more serious. Right, That's where you're going to be working on a business model and you're going to be getting your own mentors. So every team is going to be matched with their own mentor and they're going to be able to work on their business models together with them. Obviously, you should prepare for this in advance. All right, but at this, um, at this mentoring session, you will have an expert. And these are really amazing entrepreneurs, business people who have a lot of experience and a lot to offer you. So if you come prepared and you come ready to take advantage of the situation, you really can learn a lot. Then we move on to lab three, which will be about pitch training. You'll be hearing from Daniel Cronin, who is like Austria's number one pitching expert. And then you'll get your own pitch trainers. So once again, an incredible opportunity for learning, for engagement, for you to really, you know, take from experts where you can practice your pitches, perfect your pitches, make them pitch perfect. All right. And then lab four is essentially the semifinals of the pitch competition, which many of you will be preparing for. Okay. Lab four is what we call demo day, where you will pitch to a jury in what will still be a closed environment. And this jury will select the top 10 teams who will move on to the final pitching competition at conference day. Now, the final pitch award is, or the final pitch competition is gonna be an incredible event where the top 10 teams, again, selected at the demo day, will pitch to an expert jury of entrepreneurs, business people, investors, right? And to the entire community. Now. 
there's going to be a lot of prizes up for grabs, right? You'll be able to win cash prizes that you can use to kickstart your idea, as well as non-cash prizes, which are really actually, for me, a lot more exciting. These are things like office space. These are things like free consulting from incredible consulting firms and innovation firms and just a whole bunch of really cool stuff. So, you know, if you're really serious about your idea and you really believe in it, this is an incredible opportunity for you to potentially actually kickstart your idea. Now, if you don't win an award, that's also okay. You will be gaining a lot of exposure. You'll be standing up there on the stage. You'll be, you know, there'll be lots of investors. There'll be lots of business people. There'll be people who might be interested in you and your idea there, and they'll likely reach out to you if you do a good job. So this is an amazing way to expose yourself and to really, you know, get out there without putting anything on the line. But I also want to say, to those of you that are not all that interested in winning the award and you're here to learn, that's what this is all about. All right. So the awards are incredible and we're going to have an amazing day on conference day where we're going to have lots of amazing stuff going on. So if you don't make it to the final pitch award, you should still join conference day. We're going to have a startup fair. We're going to have partner workshops. We're going to have a bunch of really epic stuff going on and we want you there and, you know, enjoying the moment with us. But the point is, is that if you aren't, you know, interested in winning an award, if you're not even interested in the, getting to the finals, this is perfectly fine. Join us for these labs, gain experience, expose yourself to each other and learn about what entrepreneurship is all about. Now, today is lab one. Again, it's all about validating the problem and building a viable solution. What we'll be doing today is introducing everything like I am now. Then we'll be having Canvas, who will be joining us in a moment, who's going to be walking through problem identification. And again, you're going to be learning from an expert today. Then we'll take a break because breaks are important. And that will be followed by Marcus, another expert who will talk about the solution and business model and prepare, give you, you know, some advice on how you can prepare for the upcoming um, lab two. Then we'll be talking about our next steps where I'll also be running you guys through what the different tools that we're offering you are and the various different, um, you know, uh, like opportunities that we present for you. Okay. Um, and then finally, right, we'll be giving you guys an opportunity to present your ideas to one another and we'll be opening up breakout rooms where you guys can then, you know, shop around for team, to, for team members. Those of you who have ideas will present. Right? We'll give you a breakout room if you ask for it and then people who like your ideas can join your breakout rooms, chat to you about your ideas and maybe a match will be made. We'll also be, um, sorry, so we'll also be offering you guys an opportunity to use the ECN matching platform. Some of you are already on there, but we'll be talking to you a little bit later about how, how to set that up. If you don't know what that is, it's an incredible platform where you guys can match with one another. And on top of the breakout room session that we'll have after today's session, we'll also be having an additional session, right, after, uh, I'm sorry, next week. A essentially an extension of today, all right? So if you don't manage to find team members today, if you don't manage to find a match today, right, we're giving you an opportunity to do it again next week in an additional session. Cool. Now, that's enough of me talking. I could ramble on forever, but I'm really, really excited to bring on Canvas. Canvas is an entrepreneur and the head of startup services at the Austrian Federal Economic Chamber. So we have someone really, really important with us today, someone who knows a lot about entrepreneurship, about how to build up an idea. And before I tell you more about what he's going to talk about, I welcome Canvas. Thank you, Canvas. Floor is yours. Thank you, James. Great introduction. So hello, everyone. Great to be here. So, you know, I've been here at Entrepreneurship Avenue before. Uh, I've been here as a mentor. I've been here as a speaker, but it's always good to come back because I really believe in concepts like the Entrepreneurship Avenue and feel free to get in exchange later on because I really believe what we need in today's world, in today's like times of pandemics, conflicts, we need more entrepreneurs. We need more entrepreneurs in Austria and Europe worldwide because Entrepreneurs are problem solvers. That's why we need you, people turning ideas into great businesses. So we have heard before, my name is Canvas. I'm the head of startup services at the Austrian Federal Economic Chambers. I joined this position one and a half year ago. It was a new position, so completely new. And I remember very well that people asked me uh, when I started doing it, they asked me why. Why I'm you know, moving away from 
a startup, you know, which is dynamic, which has speed, which is very fast and driven and so on, and go into a big organization that from the outside at least doesn't seem so, you know, fast and speed and dynamic. Well, the thing is, what I'm doing now is quite similar to what I'm doing before. Why? I've been an entrepreneur like around for 10 years before I joined the position. I've co-founded several startups and then later became also an angel investor. And what I always liked to do was supporting others to work on their ideas, to convert their ideas into really a startup, into a product, into a business. So empowering them to become an entrepreneur themselves. And this is what my actually talk is about, that entrepreneurship empowers people. Like it empowered me, like it turned myself into someone who can really build something great, the same applies to you. And that's why I really believe that we just need more entrepreneurs. So I had a, I have a friend actually, I've worked with him like over the, the last couple of years in different locations and different companies. And once I asked him, how would you describe me? And he told me, I'm someone who really wants to empower people. I'm someone where people can look back at me and tell me that because of me, they didn't give up. And this is actually what entrepreneurship has led me to because I empowered myself becoming an entrepreneur. I saw the potential there and I saw how important it is to convince others as well to go this path. And that's why I'm here now. I also like trying to motivate you to, to become a startup entrepreneur, entrepreneur as well. So as you can see in this picture, um, it's a quite old picture. Uh, it's with my first startup actually, What You Do, which is an HR tag, edutech startup. It's a storytelling portal where people and their jobs are portrayed in short video clips. And the ultimate goal is to, you know, motivate young people to find the career and the job that really suits their interest. And you know, I could identify myself very strongly with this kind of idea, with this kind of product. And this is something, the first tip I want to, you know, give you that once you really can identify yourself with the, with the idea, then you will keep motivated to go on and make something great out of it. You don't have to be the exact target group. So you can build a product that doesn't serve your actual needs, but at least you should identify yourself with it. Number two, because I become an entrepreneur, it raised my self-confidence, you know? And this is something that entrepreneurship has led to because I remember not just private matters or professional matters, both of them, it really raised my confidence as a person and really made me what I'm now right now, okay? So if you're interested, um, in the last years, there have been several different startups in different verticals and industries. I've like co-founded or been active. I also I told you before, uh, became an angel investor myself. I'm still doing it, even at my position at the Chamber of Commerce. I've seen a lot of different perspectives, the founder's perspective, the investor's perspective. So that's why I believe I really can share you some, some valuable insights when it comes to like product, customer exploration, and all them stuff, the basic stuff that is important, you know, to, to make a startup great. If you're interested, you can check it also on LinkedIn. Uh, just uh, connect with me. I'm always available for one-on-one, -on -one, even after like my, my speech. As you can see, all the different stations I've been active in the last years. Um, yeah, but we can discuss on this later, if you have questions. So let's get straight into it because this was just the intro. So why is it so important that we have more entrepreneurs in society? I want to share you one simple step with you, provided with the room sifted and so on. They show us that in 2015, we had around 1.5 million net jobs created by startups in the whole of Europe. So net jobs, why net jobs? Why is it so important? Because startups are the one company profile that really create new jobs. Think about corporates. They might create jobs on the one hand, but they might also cut on the other. Actually, that's, so in the end, you have like some kind of like zero sum game. Well, with startups, it's different. And if you take a look, it's like forecasted that in 2025, this number will be more than doubled. 3.2 million jobs created by startups in Europe. And it's the same in Austria. So we're running right now a study, which we will publish soon enough, where you can see the effect startups have. That's why it's so important for you to become entrepreneurs, not just to create the jobs, but also because you create the jobs, you create impact, impact on us. And a positive, when we, what we need now are entrepreneurs. Another number, because Sometimes, you know, there are discussions with friends and acquaintances of mine, even in the startup ecosystem. So 
the, the general understanding is that Europe is lagging behind other ecosystems, North America, maybe even Israel, China. Well, it has been for quite some years, but the last two years have been some kind of game changer and it's going on. So think about it. in last year, we've created 100 new unicorns. So startups with a valuation over $1 billion, 100 unicorns, the same amount like uh, the US. So we have toppled China from the second position and it's growing and the investment volume invested in all these services are huge, so 100 billion upwards. So it's not just about like becoming a unicorn, but by becoming a unicorn, the, the chances of having impact, you know, on a global stage are quite, quite extraordinary. That's why I wanted to show you. So we are on a good path also here in Austria. And you know, I want now to get a bit deeper because there's one characteristic every good founding team needs and it has to do with customer validation as well. Okay. So you see these three companies, PayPal, Spock and Flickr. I believe most of you know them. They are global, they are digital, they have usually a platform business model, but there is something else they have in common. Some of you might guess this. It's they've all pivoted. And why is it so important to pivot, to have this characteristic, the ability to pivot? So first of all, let's start, what is pivoting? Some of you might not, don't know it. So it's like changing the path of your company because you change your product. Maybe you refocus on a specific like uh, feature or that you change your business model or that you change a target group or actually in most cases, it's a combination of all these different factors. But it's about changing the path of your company, pivoting. And a lot of good successful founders I know they have pivoted throughout the time over the years all, you know, frequently. Not because they have been like, I'm lazy, I just don't want to go with this product because the market has shown them that it's important, that it's important that you refocus, that you change your product, otherwise it won't work. And all these companies I showed you before, PayPal, it was a hardware product, um, a personal digital assistant, Spock, which was called Finally, which is, um, which was actually an online advisor for electronic products, and Flickr, which is one of my favorite founding stories, because the founder of Flickrs, he initially started with a video game. It was pretty average, but there was a chat element and people started uploading photos. And that's how the photo sharing platform Flickr was created. Some years later, he again started with a new video game. And again, it didn't work out very well, but you know, the core, you know, communicating with each other, that was successful again. And out of it, Slack was created. I believe most of you know Slack, even use it. So, this founder has always kept, you know, pivoting when there was the need to do it. So if the market and the customer tells you, hey, I'm not asking for your product, it's very important, first of all, to understand this. Second, to have the confidence to do it because changing your path can be quite difficult. It can go also like go to your self-confidence because it didn't work out, but it's not about failing. It's about changing and adjusting. Okay. So, and now if you take a look, the top reasons why startups fail, and this is based on empirics by, by Crunchbase, very like famous study. So the top three reasons are team, liquidity, and market demand. Market demand, you create a product nobody asks for, or the market is just too little. Liquidity, so maybe you don't have a business model that ensures your liquidity right from scratch, or your controlling mechanism in a team is not good enough. But the core, in my opinion, the basis of all is the team. If you have a good team, okay, you will ensure that you understand the market, you will ensure that you understand your competitors, and you will have a validated product that serves the needs of a customer. And the same with liquidity. If you have a good team, you will understand how to create a business model that ensures liquidity, and you will have controlling mechanisms. So for me, bottom up, the team is like the basis of having like a great and successful startup because it creates all the others following like characteristics. Also, same goes with like uh, pivoting. So now actually I'm already coming to my conclusion. I want to share with you further lessons because of my experience in the last years. Lessons I really had to learn myself, which took some time, but it made me a better entrepreneur. First, I think it's very important to stay true to your values. So you will be in, this, in, like in, in situations where you will have to make a very difficult decision. Okay. And the thing is, in these difficult conditions, you can tend, you know, to be opportunistic. Sometimes that could be good. 
But experience has shown me that if you really stick to your values, also as a team, so that you share same values, also like long term, this will lead to better decision midterm, long term. Okay, so this is number one lesson in my opinion of the, all of the things I've learned. Then, as I told you before, the team is decisive. The early on, the more important. You need to have a team that adds to each, each other, like in terms of hard skills. You also need to have a team that sh shares same values, otherwise it will break up. But it's very important to partner up with people you really trust. And the thing is, you can be sure in the beginning. So trust you know, and credibility is actually created over time. But if you don't see it working because you don't trust each other, trust me, it will never work. Okay? So only partner with people you really trust. Then, also, another very important point, we talked about it before, um, about like, you know, understanding what the needs of your customers are, what the market expects. That's why before you start developing your product, early on, you have to get in touch with potential customers. And you have to understand product development is never over. It's never finished. It's not static. It's dynamic. So you always have to develop your product further based on the data you collect. So always stay in close contact with your customers or potential customers to build your product further. Very important. Okay. I remember one of like a lot of startups. I've done this mistake and we developed something that was not really serving the needs of what the customers was looking for. And it's very trivial, everyone talks about it, but it is something you have to keep in mind all the time. Another very trivial point, but again, very important, you always hear this, focus, 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 yes, but even more important, focus on your core competences. So think about if you want to build, let's say, a business software as a service solution. You need someone in a team who can build the product, but you also need someone who can sell it. So imagine you have a landing page, you want to get people there, you need someone who can really set up a growth marketing concept and who executes it so that you can really grow. So everything that relates to growing your business is somehow a core competence which you should inherit and internalize. Later on, you can still, if you become bigger, you can try also get all the other competences that have been outsourced into the company as well. But I believe in the beginning, it's very important to have a good mix. Okay, so internalize your core competences, have this know-how, still work with others as well, but everything that leads to growth should be a core competence. Almost to the last point. Also something everyone talks about, how they anyone listens to it. I mean, you have to imagine I work myself seven days a week, but I have my resting time because I know how important it is to rest, to stay productive, to be effective. I have, you know, I have times where for months I've been like sleeping three, four hours and I, at this point of time, I really believed ah, I'm so productive, I'm very effective. But I then changed it and saw, okay, little sometimes is better. Or let's say less is something better. That's actually the, the right phrase. So always keep your focus on your health as well, because otherwise at one point it won't work. So the last lesson I learned, which I want to like contribute with you, also very important, I talked about it before, entrepreneurship empowered me because it raised my self-confidence and then I started like empowering others as well. Nevertheless, you have to understand, you as potential entrepreneurs, all of you, I guess, will have some kind of ego and that's good because it pushes you. It pushes you to do things others won't do because they don't dare. So until one point, having an ego is very important and good. It also helped me, but there are limits, you know, if it goes further, you start like believing you know everything better than anyone else. And this works counterproductive against yourself, but also against your team. So you have to understand where it's like, you know, this the really sweet spot where it becomes, where it starts working against you. That's why what helped me is like, I started like listening more to my partners, to other founders, to my customers, to my team. I started like talking less, but because of I, because of that I started like generating more thoughts and ideas, I could make much more profound decisions. And this also helps you if you want to set up your business. It's very important to have this ability to listen. And it's not easy, trust me, because every day I have conversations, every day I'm trying, trying to listen, but it's very important because you make better decisions. That's it. I hope you enjoyed it. 
I'm now here for your questions. I'm also available, available for one-on-ones later on. So on startupnow.it, you can also like schedule like a meetup with me. Again, I want to tell you, entrepreneurship empowers people. I want to empower you. I want this world to have more entrepreneurs because I know that we're all problem solvers. Thank you very much. I'm sure there's a, there's a loud virtual clap going on over there. <laughs> Thank you, Canvas. So, um, guys, if you have any questions, please post them in the chat, and then we, our team will be filtering them through right over here for us. But the first question I want to ask you is you said, so listen to your customers, right? So um, how do you do that in advance? How do you do that before you have customers? What are some tips that you can give um, some, of our, some of our participants who have ideas but haven't necessarily launched anything? Mm -hmm. What can they do to go and find out from customers what they might want to hear? Mm -hmm. Thanks for... Uh, um, like the question so the thing is um, there are two approaches one is like a typical canvas model because in order to start uh, developing your product you need to understand your customer so you have some kind of customer validation process you have first of all actually you start with some kind of customer metrics uh, imagine like X and Y axis where you just in terms of like what you would think position like all the different target groups you want to reach out um, how much is their pain for a solution and how much are they willing to pay? That's usually the process. And then you start the validation process because the deeper you get, the better your understanding, but you have to then validate all the hypotheses. So why would a customer use this kind of product? What's their benefit? And then you go out with qualitative research. You make like your own interviews. It can be online, it can be personal, it can be in a focus group, or you make some kind of online service. And you actually should go for at least 70 interviews that's a good good benchmark, 10 personally and the rest at least online, because then it becomes clearer for you um, what they do have in common. That's one approach. The other approach is, and something I really believe in, I call and it- you, And you guys should be taking notes, yeah. Eh? And I can send it to you later as well. So it's the effective market research. So um, I believe hardly any idea, sort of idea outside, or that is out there, is quite unique in terms of it mm. has never been there. Mm -hmm. What I believe is you have to understand what kind of competition you have and how you position a product that differs in terms of business model, in terms of features, in terms of target group and so on. Usually again, it's a mix of all of it. And when you start observing your customers and how they address the, their customers or their clients and so on, you will get an understanding how the market works. And there are tools like similar web, like Compete, like App Any and so on, where you can really understand how do they attract potential users and customers to the website, to the app, uh, uh, for which channels, for which region, and then you start also developing an understanding how the market works. So both approaches work, I would actually uh, recommend it. Amazing. That's some really good advice for you guys. So think about that now, right? You've got ideas, you want to validate them, you want to get out there, talk to people about the problems that they face and see if there's a match with what you're thinking and how you can pivot as well, right? Because you've got to change those ideas sometimes. Mm -hmm. Some more questions coming through here. I think you can see them. So when is the right time to start a company, to fund a project? Uh, I often get this question. So, you know, now I've been like, I've founded like several companies for me, it's easier. So if I have an idea, you know, I will truly found a company. But if it's your first time, I think again, it's very important first to, to understand the potential customers and to really have a good understanding of your competition. A lot of founders I met say they know the competition, but often it's just Austria or Germany or even just Europe. If you really want to understand the competition you have to screen for it worldwide so i believe you first have to get in touch with potential customers understand the competition and so on once you have started like this process you can go on with like building some kind of prototype some kind of mvp also test it mm -hmm. just to be sure and then uh, you usually find your company just one thing i want to do that so i'm a representative of the chamber of commerce something a lot of students talk with me so the moment someone believes you might earn some kind of revenue, even if it's just a landing page, this actually is enough that you um, have to like um, go for a trade license, like the okay? Ah, okay. Um, even if you don't generate revenue. I think that's a drawback in Austria, but um, in practice, I can tell you um, a lot of people don't even know it and they still um, do what they're doing. Just, just something I want to add, but first validate the customer, get an understanding, have an, some kind of prototype, also test it and once you're sure you can go for funding the company yeah. so i think the point is to 
actually make um, what's the word like data driven decisions mm -hmm. you know actually go out there figure out if it's possible mm -hmm. so where exactly can we reach out to me to come is so yeah we have LinkedIn you can connect with me there um, on Facebook as well but better LinkedIn then uh, www.startupnow.at here you can also schedule like one-on-one -on -one meetups with me every Thursday between 10 and 1 o'clock um, feel free um, I really enjoy you know exchanging with, with founders Number three is, yeah, which books are important for you? So this is actually a question um, or uh, some, some, you know, um, a lot of founders, you know, read a lot of books, lot of books. Um, and they always like um, they recommend different kind of books that help them. So the thing is, what I can tell you, um, I don't have like one author, not to, also not just like in a, an area like startup or entrepreneurship that I'm really um, attracted to where I say, okay, um, I'm really going forward to it. Yeah, it's more like a mix of different books I read. So it can be like books um, regarding st building your own startups, Eric Ries, Lean Startups, typical standard literature, you know. But I also really enjoy reading books out of context because it helps me to widen my horizon. Okay, uh, there are really um, 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 good good books out there. Uh, if you want, I can share you later with them uh, some of my personal favorites. Um, there are quite few. Mm -hmm. You mean so just like some good novels and so on and so forth? Exactly. Yeah. So this can also widen your horizon uh, because I really think it's important to put yourself into the perspective of others, also as an entrepreneur. Yeah. And once you read these books, you can understand also the other perspective. Yeah, yeah. Apart from like talking to others, that's, that's another. Understanding thing. people is exactly. such a big part of being an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. All right. Someone asked, when do you believe it makes sense to pivot and when to put, you yeah. know, to carry on? Yeah. Yeah. How do you know when that moment is right? It's quite hard. It's quite tricky. Um, I've also had discussion with this, you know, some, some startup teams pivoting and investors told them, ah, you didn't like pursue your idea long enough. Why did you do it? So first of all, I mean, um, what you can do is like observe the market in terms of like if the customer demand changes. So for instance, if you see you're not generating enough leads, you're not like um, um, turning enough leads into like customers. That can be one like hint, but it can also just because your sales sucks. That's also one. <laughs> okay? um, yeah, second, fix your marketing. Second is it's very important to observe your, your competitors as well, direct and indirect, what they are doing. This gives you also an understanding. Um, sometimes it's just just general market changes. Think about the pandemics. I, for instance, had a startup called Carpoli in Mobility Tech, which was then exited as well. So the thing was, it was a carpooling app uh, where uh, employees of a certain company uh, matched together in a carpool and then went to, to work. And they were like, they didn't have to pay, the company paid, um, but they went to work and they even got benefits. So the thing was, it really worked well. We were at even TV shows, it exploded, a lot of like uh, uh, traction. And, and suddenly you had this pandemic, the Corona yeah. apps, and suddenly no one is driving to work anymore, you know? So the thing was now, how do we evaluate it? Do we believe this is something that will be like more long-term, one year, two year? Because if that's the case, then you have to for sure pivot. Yeah. So what we did was like observing, trying to go with, with the same product. First of all, make the research, talk with our customers, see what are their plans, then see what the competition did. And then we started at least some kind of, um, at least part, let's say part pivot. So not the whole product, but we created a new product out of it, tested it as well, and then we just tried to see, okay, what works and what doesn't work, what, which of this product over time. And then we decide, okay, the main product doesn't work so much, and then we stick to the new product. This is one way you can do it. At the end, I don't believe you can be 100% sure, Yeah. okay? Data is important, you need to collect it, you need to do some kind of forecasting, um, but um, often it works. Yeah, it's tough. I can relate to that. Mm -hmm. I have a small education company in South Africa. We do tutoring and the, we did everything in person, mm -hmm. classes in person, and then the pandemic hit. Mm -hmm. And we obviously had to move everything online. And now the question has been, do you stay online or do you go back to running classes in person? Mm -hmm. And we're slowly learning that, you know, people have changed. And I mean, here we are running an online workshop, right? So, but it is interesting. You have to listen to your customers and you never really know what's going on. Mm -hmm. Bunch of more questions coming through. Um, so how do you take know your if your team members are a good fit? Yeah. How do you know if the team member is a good fit? So um, tough. I mean, I think first of all you need uh, to take some time to understand 
how someone performs and not just like in good times but also in critical times. So critical times can change your know, narrative and then you suddenly see okay if someone performs or not. Um, what I believe um, you need a good mix of different kind of like um, um, characters but who share the same value. I think that's the ultimate like number one thing you need to do. People who share the same values that's very important. Sure you have like goals, you have like metrics um, or metrics uh, which you track, which you see if it works or doesn't work, but they could be different depending on what the, the person is doing. But you need also time, time to give yourself, but also the others to see if they can perform. So think about a sales team. If you have a product in the B2B a safe sales life cycle, where let's say the average time to closing a, um, a company takes about like six to 12 months, then if you already cut someone after like two, three weeks, that could be too early. Yeah. Okay, could be too early. So I think. Uh, depending on what kind of activity this person should do, you need to see and to define the time you want to track it. But um, in the end, you use like frameworks like OKR, Objective Key Results, and so on. There are different kind of frameworks. Uh, you work that goes out with them. You give them time, but you also shouldn't give too much time because if you have like, for instance, already two conversation with someone because it doesn't or she doesn't perform, it doesn't match the goals. Third time could be just too much. Okay, so also give everyone time, but not too much. Uh, give constant feedback. Um, really set the expectation management in both directions very clear. This is something that's very difficult and it takes time. It took me years. It will take you some years, I believe, or some time at least. Um, but it will work out. Okay. What do you think about personal fit? Do you think that that's also quite important? How people get along. I mean, we had um, we had Alex from Quinpanion at kickoff, and he said one of the questions they ask them they he asks whenever there's a new hire is, could I see myself having a drink with this person on a Friday mm -hmm. night? Yeah. So I think this depends on your own characteristics. So yeah. there are founders where it's very important that they really can get along with someone. For me, for instance, maybe because I'm already now 34 years old, so I've seen other stuff. For me, it's not that important anymore. For me, it's more about, can I respect the person? And can, mm -hmm. do I believe he respects me or she respects me? I think this is more important for me, but you know, for a lot of founders, this is important. For someone, and, and particularly in the beginning, but you know, after like, if you really scale up, this yeah. becomes even more difficult. Is there already an Oscar Limited? No, it isn't. <laughs> so it's already like two years in the process. Um, it's like still like not at the point actually I want to have it or all oh, we decided because we don't want to have it. Um, we're still working on it. Um, like the, the launch date is supposed to be this year. Um, but let me tell you something. Uh, the Austrian Limited shouldn't be an excuse for you to start or not to start a company. Okay, if you have a good idea and particularly more a good team, and if you are really, you know, behind your idea and you really work on it, the Austrian Limited is not like the, the guarantee for your success. It's about you and your team. I like this next question a lot is how do you build an MVP when you and your co-founders lack the necessary skills and also don't have the funding to hire and let's throw in an ele another element you're also working a job on the side maybe how do you go build that MVP how do you get software development and so on this is I think where a lot of people get stuck so my first uh, suggestion is get someone uh, in terms of like software development into your co-founding team yeah. I think that's the, the basis you need to do this I mean there are also like external partners specifically who address teams like like yours I think uh, who don't have the, the like the knowledge but I think better it would be to get someone on board very early on you have to screen you have to like make research it is difficult but it's possible I think that's the basis actually otherwise you will be too dependent on others uh, apart from that um, you can try to get you know your first type, type of investment by your close surroundings like family friends uh, personal acquaintances there are even like angel investors who are investing very early on, but usually having a prototype MVP is is quite important for most of the yeah. investors also I know. And there are like fundings as well. There are good incubators here. We have Aves First, for instance, uh, just one to name few. There are like other A plus B incubator one throughout like whole of Europe. Uh, Europe, I mean Europe as well, but particularly in Austria, uh, where you can also just go there with an idea and work on it. Uh, the competition is tough, it's not so easy to, to get there, but it's possible and they will also like then fund you like with your uh, development process, okay? 
Any special considerations to make when launching a product without any direct competitors? So when you're in the, the what everybody wants to enter, which is the blue ocean. I often heard this, you know, blue ocean. Yeah. <laughs> and if you take a look in detail, you see there's actually no blue ocean. So it's something True. that can be critical, uh, also from an investor's perspective. Um, so, I mean, sure, having blue ocean is great. Uh, the thing is, I'm not sure what what you want to know specific about this question, but um, I think also just let me give you an understanding from the from the funders' perspective, from investors or like uh, a, a grant uh, institution and so on. Um, for them, the market potential is very important. So number yes. one, team. Number two, market potential. How big is the market? So and if it's a like a blue ocean. Um, so it's something where you don't have just the numbers in terms of how much is it growing, how big yeah. is it. What you need to do is like to still put it into numbers in a logical way. And what you can do is like using benchmark from other industries, okay? Or maybe startups who also were like working in a blue ocean um, uh, environment and try to see if there are some kind of analogy. But you need to put it down into numbers. You have you need to have like some kind of logical um, 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 calculations. Yes. And this can also be enough. Apart from that, um, still, you continue doing so, you test um, uh, and see how it works and if it's really a blue ocean and if there's really a need, you know, to, uh, uh, that, that needs to be solved by you. Yeah, sure. So, um, um, I remember just one, one, one quote, very old-fashioned entrepreneur, Henry Ford, yeah. he, he all once said that, so because I, yeah, because I once said, said it uh, some weeks ago in another, like, um, a keynote. So, the thing was, uh, he said, if you would ask your customers what they're looking for, they would say horses, faster horses. Okay. So um, sometimes there is a need where people and customers are not aware of. Okay. And sometimes you can create a product that actually is much better than what they're looking for, which they're not even sure of. Yeah. But still, it's very difficult to reach. You know, a lot of startups believe it, they have it, they know it. Often it's not the case. Um, but this could always be one way. Sometimes you can almost be too early as well. I mean, some people, they, 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 there are inventions that we used that only launched on the markets today or in the last years. They came up 20 years ago, but we weren't yeah. ready for them. Yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point. Think about um, iPad. So there were tablets before, yes. but the market was not there. And Apple surely has like some great market power as well. Yes. But the time of entry can be very decisive. You don't have to be the first one, you know. It can also be someone who's just following and then just execute it in a better way. And one last question from the audience. Um, how do you identify existing solutions to your problem? How do you identify an existing solution to your problem? Maybe I need some more context into this question. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I can, I, I can help you. I guess mm -hmm. I think you've got to break down what your problem is and then see if there are people trying to solve this problem. Am I, am I right? I mean, I guess, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so, I mean, this has to do, I believe, like with general market research. Huh? Yeah, we have exactly. to take a look what is out there. Actually, sometimes it's enough just to use the uh, the right combination of like keyword phrases, which relates to your problem, and then go for it. We'll look at for it like in search engines and see what pops up. And usually, uh, there are a lot of like uh, results. And then you have to screen not just the first page, but like the next 10, 20 pages. And then usually we find a lot. Apart from that. You can just um, look for, you know, all these startup databases we have out there. There are a lot of databases, yeah. DRoom, Crunchbase, Broadcast and Trending Topics, where you can look for it. If if I've understood the question, right? If not, we can still have like in a one-on-one, -on -one, like talk about it. Yeah. yeah. Cool, Camus, thank you so much. It was wonderful having you here with us. I think you, the, the audience learned a lot from you and I learned a lot as well. So we appreciate it. Thank you as well. And hear you soon. Bye-bye. Yeah. So Camus gave you guys his LinkedIn information. Um, you guys feel free to reach out to him, an incredible, an incredible person who's got a lot of knowledge to offer. I mean, we just had only so much time now. Um, I think we could all sit here all day and all night, but we do have to move on. The show must go on. So again, a big shout out to Canvas. I wish we could all hear you guys clapping. Um, I know there's a lot of virtual clapping going on. So thank you, Canvas. Um, all right, so I just want to, ooh, which way are we going now? We're carrying on, we're carrying on. And here we are. <laughs> Sorry, guys. 
So I want to um, I want to just recap some of the really important things that we want you guys to be focusing on now in preparation um, for the next labs and you know to build those fundamentals that you need for your for your business idea. So the first again, which is what Canvas spoke on, is the idea of problem validation. All right, you need to break your problem down into assumptions. So ask yourself this problem right what exactly is it what assumptions are there that this problem is based on what do i am i assume that there is this problem right is that true so you need to figure out what exactly are those assumptions write them down and almost create what we call hypotheses all right and then it's about testing those hypotheses you do that by listening to your customers like canvas said by conducting surveys by interviewing people by going out there and figuring out is this problem actually a problem all right so write down the most important assumptions you've got and challenge them with customer feedback the next idea is uh, and, and this carries on here with this idea of the lean startup method all right so you know this is kind of repeating what i've just said but Build right, your hypotheses, go and measure them. Now, this idea of an MVP, I just want to speak a little bit on this as well. You don't always need to build an entire app. If your idea is an app, if your idea is an app that is a service, you don't necessarily have to go and build that app in order to have an MVP. Ask yourself, how could I offer that service in the easiest possible way? Can I set up a Google Drive link to deliver videos that people want to see? Can I create a WhatsApp group where there is a marketplace of some sort, right? Usually your ideas are not the technology themselves, right? That's not where the value lies, but the value lies in some sort of, you know, some sort of offering that you're creating. You know, another example that I learned, if there was, a, there was an example that we did in a course where the idea was an app for um, sourcing printing with people near nearby and the idea was that if you're at a university or you're at a, at a place where they don't have printing let's say and you want to print something would um, and you could find the people nearby right who have printers and they could print for you now that is built based on the assumption that people struggle to find printers so what if you just went out there and put up big signs and says I'll print your things for you right? If you realize that lots of people need printing help, then you have a basic assumption sorted. You've, you've, you've validated a problem that is fundamental to your idea. So I don't know if we, if we quite understood my, my, my example here, but the idea is, again, you don't have to necessarily build the whole thing to figure out if the problem is real. And you can build a minimal viable product without going all the way. And finally, learn. Take that feedback Right. If you realize that something's wrong, build on that. Build on what you've learned. Re-measure and carry on the process. And then you need to figure out who your customers are. You often think that the people who have the problems don't actually have um, the people that you think have the problem that you're trying to solve might not always be them. Right. There might be other people out there who are really facing this problem. There, there, there might not be enough people. So you need to ask yourself. Who really is my question? Uh, is my customer? What is their problem? And is it really a pain point enough that they would be willing to pay money to fix that? And then finally, we need to measure that. Are there enough of these people? Do we have enough custom potential customers who actually care? We now need to run through a few details just before we bring on our next speaker, who I'm really, really excited to hear from. The first thing is what you have to do to qualify for the final pitch award. So remember earlier we spoke about the fact that many of you here are doing the labs just for the learnings and that's totally okay. But if you're here at the labs for the learnings and to make it to the final pitch award where you have the chance to win awards and I mean the final pitch competition where you have a chance to win awards and you have a chance to get a lot of exposure, right? There's a few basic rules. The first one is that you have to have at least one student on your team. Now, I know that there's a few people out there who are not students, and that's totally great. I mean, we love having you guys with us, right? My ELP fellows, I know that you're out there watching today, right? And we love it that you're here because you bring a lot of energy, you bring a lot of knowledge, you know, to this environment. But 
right? The Entrepreneurship Avenue was built for students. And there's a lot of students here. And it would be unfair if, you know, working people could come in and compete solely in their, on their own with other students. So we need you guys to at least have one student on your team member, I mean, on your team, um, and then it's totally fine. Now, if you can't find a student, and remember, we have the matchmaking that we're going to do at the end of today. We have the matchmaking ECN platform. We're going to have another matchmaking session soon, right? So there's a lot of opportunities for you to find that student if you want and to find a way to get them involved in your team, right? And really get value out of them and give them value as well. Um, but if you cannot find a student, reach out to us. As I said, I know there's ELP fellows out there. Many of us, we're all connected, right? And we can help you find a student. So if you are here and you want to carry on and you want to make it to the final pitch competition, right? Then, and you can't find a student, then just reach out to us. If you just want to stay for the learnings, that's totally fine. These are the rules for the final pitch competition only, all right? So yeah, I just hope that that's, that's clear to you guys. Now. You have to have at least one team member at every lab, all right? That is just one team member at every lab in order for you to qualify for the final pitch award and to get your certificate, okay? Now, I don't know why you would miss any of the labs, right? We're going to have mentoring. We're going to have pitch training. There's so much going on. You, all your team members should be at all the labs, but if not possible, for whatever reasons, one team member at every lab. And then finally, um, you need to qualify during lab four a demo day. So again, in order to make it to lab four, you need to follow these rules. And then at demo day, that is when the jury will choose the top 10 teams that will move on to the final conference day. And those of you that don't make it, you know, don't stress. You learned a lot and you can still join the conference day as a non-competitor. One last thing again is that even if you don't make it to the end, you will get a certificate. So just carry on throughout these labs and you will get a certificate that you can use. And this is useful one day if you found another company, you want to show it to investors, you want to show it to potential employers. Okay, so before I you know, ramble on for too long, a couple more things. The tools that we're going to make available to you, right? The first one is the ECN matching platform. I've already talked about this. So this is where you can meet your co-founders. Now, there are two types of people out there who don't have team members. There are the ones that have ideas and are seeking people with skills to join them, right? You can post your idea on the ECN map, uh, platform. You can state that you are an Entrepreneurship Avenue contestant. It gives a little star at the, on, on your profile. And then people can come and find you. You can also say exactly what the skills that you're looking for are, right? And this will help make a perfect match. If you don't have an idea, but you have skills to offer, then you want to go look on the platform. And from what I believe, you can also create a profile and post that you are looking to join a team and you can tell people what skills you have. The next thing that we're going to be offering you guys is the tool by What A Venture. Now, I've personally used this tool myself and it's incredible. You can use this to develop your project, right? Now, I'm not going to go into too much detail. We're going to send a video out um, about it. But I just want to see. Oh, yeah. So we have the matching platform here. This is what the, the tool will look like, right? You can develop your project. It gives you videos on how to build a business model. It shows you step by step how to validate your ideas. And it gives you a place to record all this information. So it's really, really useful. And I highly suggest you guys do it. And like I said, we'll be sending out a video to explain more about it. The next thing that is not on this list that I want to go back to is the AWS. Now, every single one of you, and I think this is amazing, every single one of you who have a project are being offered a thousand euros in cloud storage, right, for any MVPs that you want to build. So again, someone asked earlier, what if you don't have money for MVPs? Well, we can't hire a software developer for you. We're sorry about that. But AWS is offering a thousand euros of cloud storage for you to use for building an idea. So I don't know many places where you can get such an amazing offer, right? Last year, this was only for a winner. Now it's for everybody. So take advantage of this. And the final thing is the Entrepreneurship Avenue Academy. We've created videos to help you learn about entrepreneurship, about building a business, what it takes to start up, validating ideas and blah, 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 right? There's so much that you can learn. And it's really gonna be useful, particularly for those of you that don't have business skills. Remember we said entrepreneurship is for everyone, 
right? But obviously there are some business fundamentals that you want to learn and we want to create, we've, well, we have created that for you. We have this video academy that you can make use of. All of this will be mailed out to you, right? So keep an eye on your mails that will be coming soon and you can make use of all of these amazing opportunities. And now it's enough rambling on by me. I'd like to introduce Marcus. Marcus is an entrepreneur, a CEO, and an impact investor who's done incredible things. He's founded Inoko and Zuvu. I hope I pronounced that correct. And um, yeah, before I tell you any more about Marcus, I'm going to bring Marcus on. Thank you, Marcus. Here we go. That's yours. Thank you. And hello, everybody. Really excited to be back here to VU. I studied here a long time ago, and I'm really excited to be back here with you guys. Um, my name is Marcus, as you've heard already. Um, I have uh, basically uh, founded back in 2006, uh, during my time here at the Vienna University of Economics and Business Administration, my first startup, uh, Subu, uh, later on now my second startup, Inoko, uh, and I'm active uh, as also as an impact angel investor at the same time, supporting startups that have globally scalable business models with a positive uh, impact on the climate crisis and or the biodiversity crisis. Uh, so my first startup, Suwu, basically, as mentioned, started here at Vienna University uh, of Economics and Business Administration. It's a software as a service uh, technology provider. It's a technology that uh, enables customers like Amazon, like Microsoft, like Unilever to develop and optimize digital assistants that help consumers choose products that fit their needs. So for example, um, a product advisor that would help you choose the right mattress, the right uh, washing machine, the right TV, based on a couple of questions, um, figuring out what your needs are and recommending the right product. Company meanwhile has more than 200 employees in seven countries, offices in London and Boston, Vienna, Berlin, and several other cities. Uh, during my time alone, we have raised more than 25 million in venture capital. And in 2018, um, I decided to hand over to a scale-up CEO, very experienced uh, a CEO. I could hand over to him at a triple-digit growth rate, um, helped him to get into the business, and um, then basically stepped back from my operational uh, duties at Suvo. Um, then I basically took a year off, <clears throat> which was really exciting because, you know, the previous years I spent most of my time uh, on airplanes contributing rather in a negative way to the climate crisis, unfortunately. Um, and during that time off, we bought an RV and uh, traveled through Northern Europe. So we visited Norway and Sweden and all these Northern European countries. And it was really an exciting time, but it was also a time where I learned very much uh, that, uh, you know, how things are going with regards to the climate crisis, with regards to the biodiversity crisis, the uh, year when we were up in Norway, hundreds of reindeer starved to death in the middle of the winter because it started to rain during winter, the rain froze and they didn't have access to the grass uh, beneath anymore that usually they, they feed on during winter time as well. Um, and that in combination with the fact that my uh, second son, Paul, was in his way, really inspired me to get active and to do something against those crises. Um, I decided at that time to become active as an angel investor, supporting startups in that field, but I also decided to found my own company. And uh, that's now my second startup with Inoko, which I founded here in Vienna in 2020. Mm, you will learn a bit more about it, but it basically helps uh, consumers to choose more sustainable products, products that are better for the environment, for the climate and themselves. And <clears throat> we really uh, motivate consumers to um, yeah, go into that direction. We meanwhile have uh, more than 40 employees, uh, more and more cool customers. Um, yeah, and you'll learn a bit more about um, Inoko shortly. So uh, first of all, I'm really excited that you decided to spend your time here uh, at this workshop, at this cool event, because uh, being interested and in becoming an entrepreneur is an amazing uh, step that you took here and, and, and really, uh, yeah, for me, uh, one of the best choices I've ever made in my life to really decide to become an entrepreneur because I really already very early on from the time at school, at the university, I realized, hey, um, the thing I really love is coming up with a great idea, uh, getting people excited about it, and then building something uh, out of the ground that has never been done before. 
And this is one of the most fulfilling things that you can do in your life. So congratulations for your decision to participate here. And now you're at the stage where you actually identify the problem or learn how to identify problems, how to validate that basically there is a large enough market uh, to build a business around that model. And what I'm going to talk about um, is how to build a business model around the idea that, that, that you have in mind. And I'm going to use uh, Inoko as a showcase here uh, because I think it's a very interesting example um, to look at. First of all, uh, our problem that we identified, our idea was obviously how can we help? So we realized that more and more consumers are becoming aware that 70% of the biodiversity loss on land is caused by the products that you and I buy at the supermarket every day. And uh, more and more consumers realize that um, the from a climate perspective, um, 26% of the uh, greenhouse gas emissions are caused by the food that we eat every day. And there are lots and lots of consumers who really want to make a difference and who want to have a positive impact here, but they simply don't know how. So this was kind of the problem that we identified. The solution that we then um, started to build is our Inoko app. Um, it's an app that allows you to scan the grocery receipts at uh, Billa here in Austria, at Spa, at Hofer, so you just pay at the grocery, um, you scan your receipt, and then you get a, a in detailed analysis of the CO2 footprint of the products. So you would see what's CO2 footprint of uh, the overall basket, what's the footprint of the individual products you purchased, which are high in CO2, which are low in CO2. And on the right screen, you would see that you even get insights on the impact uh, of products from a biodiversity perspective, from a health perspective, from an animal welfare perspective. So you see how much space the chicken that you, you're you eating basically had. And uh, yeah, you can get alternative recommendations and much more. This was kind of um, the idea of the product that we had. And um, we also realized that just providing information isn't enough, but we also wanted to give consumers uh, basically challenges, but also reward them for moving into the right direction. So we decided to uh, start working with uh, brands, sustainable brands, who are basically uh, offering sustainable uh, food and beverage products. And we allowed them to present their more sustainable products on our platform um, and to also sponsor or provide um, the cashback vouchers, uh, which allow you actually now to go to the supermarket uh, do some challenges and if you win those challenges you are being rewarded with uh, cashback vouchers um, from those sustainable brands and over time you know you can learn more about um, your nutrition and how you can improve it but the big challenge that uh, comes right after the idea and this is what I really want to focus on now is the question how the heck are you going to make money out of that because there's a big difference between having, idea, having an idea that people love and that people kind of, you know, and a product that people want to use and really creating a product that uh, has a, a business model uh, underneath uh, that allows you to really make money out of it. And this is really crucial for us, especially as we want to have an impact at a global scale and not be a tiny little app here in Austria. Um, and we can only scale and um, you know, conquer the world uh, quickly if we also have the financial resources to do so. And this is why for us it was so important to develop um, a, not only a sustainable business model, but really a very strong business model that basically fuels um, the engine and allows us to invest into growth. A great way to start looking at a business model is a methodology which is called Business Model Canva. I mean, it sounds very sophisticated. In reality, it's not that complex. It's basically a sheet where you try to note down, okay, who are the key partners that might play a role in your <clears throat> business with regards to business idea? Um, what are the key activities of the business? What are the resources that you need as a business? What's the value proposition that you're offering to your consumers? Mm which relationship do you might might have with customers which channels can you sell through so you do have do you have to sell or market your product directly or can you also get partners on board who help you to get win business what different type of customer segments might your product be relevant for is it just one target group or are there multiple segments that you can cater to what does the cost perspective look like and what are potential revenue streams and 
while you basically work on that slide or on that um, frame, um, you will figure out that you will get some inspiration in terms of how you can make money out of your product. And we at Inoko, we had many ideas how we can potentially make uh, money out of it. Obviously, uh, you know, one idea was, hey, uh, we could sell consumer research data. We will have such a lot of amount of data. We know which products are purchased with, with what, from who, by whom, um, how much are you spending overall. Uh, so it's really great data that, that we will uh, basically uh, collect based on the fact that um, our users are kind of, um, you know, scanning their, their grocery receipts with our app. Um, and yeah, we definitely thought, okay, that, 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 that's a great way uh, to, to sell the analytics. But we also thought about, hey, we can use that audience and we can ask them questions from friends and chart from, from, from brands, sustainable brands. You know, how did you like my product? Uh, do you have, how would you rate it? Will you buy it again and charge those brands um, for these services? We also thought about potentially uh, offering our users the opportunity to offset their emissions. So, you know, hey, this month um, your food-based emissions were, I don't know, uh, X hundred kilogram. Uh, if you pay uh, Y amount of money, you can offset it. We obviously thought about partnerships with sustainable brands that can position their more sustainable products on our app. We thought about uh, cities and communities, um, giving them teams on Inoko and basically allowing them to get people engaged with regards to how to become more sustainable as a city and, you know, um, get them kind of have a, have a um, platform that allows them to drive change within the city, within the community. Um, and um, we had a similar model in mind with regards to uh, corporate partners. So corporate uh, corporates basically inviting their team members, their employees into teams and figuring out and, and, and doing challenges together and giving feedback on the impact and so on. And last but not least, um, our B2B model, which we didn't have on the radar at all, because initially we thought that all those retailers out there are going to basically um, you know, they're bringing us in front of court or they're trying to sue us because we are providing a lot of transparency about the products which they are offering. And not all of these products out there are very sustainable and are very good. So we actually thought that they wouldn't be super happy about us. But ultimately, they approached us and said, hey, you know, can we do something together? Can we offer a similar solution to our own shoppers? Um, and here you can see how, where business models can come from. So sometimes you start a business and you already exactly know how you're going to make money out of it. But sometimes also during the process, new opportunities arise that you didn't even think about uh, firsthand. Um, for Inoko, we tried a lot of those things and we really, you know, built, built a product and we really got started. And for the first stage, uh, we rather sooner than later could cancel out some of those opportunities like consumer research. We didn't have enough users, um, uh, consumer data, also not enough users. Um, the offsetting mm, doesn't really work that well for other apps. So we, 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 we didn't pursue it further cities. We tried it, it was a horrible, uh, you know, experience to try to sell to uh, cities took us ages to get in contact with them. So we also had to basically cancel it out. And now we are basically focusing on um, uh, two business models with regards to our consumer app. One is partnerships with sustainable brands that deliver ads. The other one is corporate partners uh, with their own teams, you know, engage their teams, offer them challenges and get them engaged and involved with regards to the company's uh, sustainability. Um, uh, initiatives and the third one is a complete new business model and complete new products that arise out of that which is our b2b business model because what we do now is we offer grocery retailers to um, get the data of the co2 footprint of their products at their shelves into the online shops into their consumer apps um, we enable them to provide you as a consumer guidance right at the store within the online shop and we support them with um, sustainability engagement solutions, which are solutions that kind of incentivize consumers to move into a more sustainable direction. And this was really, you know, completely during the process, we never thought that that would ever play a role, but pointed out, it turned out to be a very important business model for us now. 
Um, yeah, uh, so far about uh, Inoko and about um, how I would recommend to really look at uh, your business model. So business model is really crucial because no money, uh, no progress, no developers that you can pay, no further products that you can build. Uh, so really, you need to build this business model at the core of your product and you need, should spend a lot of time in uh, figuring out uh, what your business model could look like and sometimes also just try it out. But as quickly as possible, really focus on one or two business models that really will move the needle uh, for you instead of, you know, spreading yourself too thin into too many areas. And um, yeah, it's, you know, usually as a startup, you don't always have a business model from day one on, uh, but it's really a process of being passionate about what you want to do, build a first prototype, um, try it out as early as possible, try to fail early and also try to fail early with regards to your business model. Um, and it's really trial and error in many cases. And you also need to be open to pivoting sometimes and saying, okay, this didn't work out. Now let's give this other idea a try. And again, here try to validate or fail as quickly as possible. Last but not least, um, I would like to invite you to really watch live how we at Enoco are uh, continuously working on redefining our business model, our app. I would like to invite you to download the Enoco app. Uh, you can download the Enoco app in your app store. And if you sign up with the code EA2022, we actually provide you a voucher where you get, I think, five or six products, either free of charge or minus 50%, like no more ice cream, like Rebel Meat Burgers. You can right away head to the store of your choice, buy the products there, and we're going to refund 50 to 100% of the uh, product to you. And you can then continue using the app, scan your receipts and basically learn more about your shopping. At the same time, you will see how we uh, evolve here as a company because we're still in the, in, in, in the midst of optimizing our business models. Um, yeah, and uh, really would like to thank you for participating here, um, for deciding to invest your evening and your time into exploring opportunities around entrepreneurship. And I keep my fingers crossed for you and definitely would like to encourage you to look at business ideas that have a positive impact on the climate, on the biodiversity, because there's nothing more fulfilling than during your entrepreneurial experience addressing one of the key topics of our time and really not only being able to, you know, generate money and live out, out of it or build a big business, but at the same time have a positive impact either on the climate or on biodiversity or social issues. That's what I really want to encourage you to do. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marcus. I think there's a big virtual round of applause. So can we, you know, touch those, those reactions and give us those emojis? Um, a big thank you, Marcus, for that. Thank it was you. really inspiring to see what you've done. You know, one of the things that I resonate a lot with, um, and I think maybe a lot of people feel, is that they think like business is supposed to be about making money. And I don't know if you agree, or if you probably do, but I feel like business runs the world, right? And we have to change the way that business works. And you can, you can make money, and you can make money sustainably, and make a fundamental difference along the way. Yeah. Making money is really, this should be the side effect, in my opinion, of uh, running a business and setting up a business. That, that's what will automatically kind of happen when you create a lot of value for a lot of people, but it shouldn't be your main motivation from my perspective. And yes, businesses need to drive and generate money, obviously, because else they won't, yeah, won't be there and they won't be able to scale. And, you know, it's nice and, and it also has a place, you know, there are also small local businesses and that play an important role. But for me personally, it was always important to do something right. I, you know, where my company can be a global leader and where we can really champion a new idea. And this is what I get a lot of energy out of and it really excites me a lot. I love that. I love that. So if it's not clear, guys, now it's time for Q&A. So if you guys have any questions, please throw them into the chat. Our team will be figuring out which questions are the best. So write some good questions, no jokes, but they'll be putting them on the screen for us to see. So one of the first questions that came up in the chat is why are VCs investing so much in sustainability startups? And I'll add on to that today. Yeah. Right, what, what, what made them change their mind? I mean, climate yeah. change has been obvious yeah. for so long. I think it's not for altruistic reasons. It's not because they think they have to, because they owe it to their kids. It's because 
yes, partly due to that reason, but primarily because they think, and they and I share that belief, that um, we are in the midst of a massive, massive, massive transition process. Governments, consumers will demand from businesses yeah. that they lower their CO2 footprint, that they lower their impact on biodiversity, and that creates pressure on those companies to do so. But those businesses can't do that on their own. They need a million of solutions to really lower their impact and to lower, you know, the burden on biodiversity. They kind of need, you know, <laughs> the, the, the cars that are not fueled by, by gasoline anymore. They need uh, freezing systems, they need buildings, and they can't just, you know, just build all that stuff on their own, but they need innovative solution providers, which are very, very frequently startups. And these startups have huge um, uh, market opportunities that yeah. arise out of that. And that's the very logical reasons why VCs actually invest in sustainability. Very true. Also, do you think the customer is changing? Do you think absolutely. people, I mean, customers are, are not happy to buy from Yeah, absolutely. From unsustainable. I mean, there are, every one of us has so many levers. I mean, we are obviously voters, you know, we can decide which party has a say. Uh, we are consumers. Every day we vote with our uh, purse how the world is going to look like a couple of yeah. years down the road. Because if we stop spending money on those brands and those products that are destroying our planet, they will go out of business. It's easy like that. And they will feel the pressure that they can continue like that. And, you know, we as an investor, um, we have the responsibility and the opportunity to invest into things that have a positive impact on the planet. Uh, and there are so many, you know, as parents, I mean, you guys are a bit too young to think about that topic. But <laughs> overall, you know, there's lots and lots of opportunities for Some us. Some of us are getting there. <laughs> but yeah, we, we have opportunities for the future generations and so on that you're thinking about. Yeah, yeah. no, totally. Um, more questions. So how did you gain your investors' trust? Um, was harvesting and reselling data a part of your original pitch deck? Um, I mean, I obviously had the advantage uh, now with Inoko that I already um, had proven myself, I had already built a very large uh, uh, company. So I had some, um, yeah, for sure, some investors, you know, said, okay, if this guy is doing that, sounds crazy, but maybe there are chances that something gets out of it. Um, uh, that, that, that was kind of a little bit, you know, easier in my case, I, mean, I need to say. Um, but how we ultimately, uh, you know, could, could, could convince our first investors was also that we brought, we brought them the data. So we run very early proof of concepts where we uh, basically put out uh, ads on Facebook and Instagram where we pretended that the product that we envisioned was already there. Uh, we sent users that clicked onto those ads onto a landing page and uh, told them, hey, sorry, we actually tricked you. The product's not there, but if you fill out the following survey, uh, you, will, you will be one of our first test users. You can have access to test user experience. Then those users filled out the questionnaire, spent 10 minutes on that, and then we even asked them to send us a, uh, um, an image of their receipt, uh, you know, whenever they shop and to upload it onto our server. And we then manually gave them some feedback, how they are trending from a CO2 perspective, we made them aware about certain products that were conflicting with their mm -hmm. priorities and values. So we really tried to boil it down to, you know, yeah. run an MVP as quickly as possible. And we could really gather very valuable data points because we realized, okay, how much money does it cost to acquire a user? Um, it was amazing for us that people really manually, you know, took pictures of their recipes, went to a server, uploaded it, super complicated. Yeah. I looked it up in an email. So that was those were all data points that really validated um, that there is a need from the consumer side. Mm, and our investors believed obviously the story that um, you know once we have users, sustainable brands are going to be very interested in um, addressing them. Uh, I think that the data topic was already part of the original uh, deck, but I think it was clear for everyone. Obviously, we are only talking about anonymous data, about highly aggregated data, never about individual data, just to make that very clear. <laughs> um, yeah, it was already part of the, of the original data. Thank you for that, um, what you just told everybody though, about how you went out there to validate your idea, because I think in our previous, um, just before you came on, we looked at valid problem validation. And one of the, one of you guys out there were asking about how do you build an MVP without software developers, without you know having the resources to do that. And here's a great example. 
Create a quick website, and websites are not that hard to make. Get it out there if you can. Put a little bit of money into ads. You know, get it out there and see if people click. See if people go and try and get onto that service that you're offering. Absolutely. That was, I mean, what you just yeah. explained was really brilliant. Yeah. And the, you took it a step further. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and there are a lot of, you know, DIY website and form builders. And yeah, really try, try to think how, how can you fake it until you make it? How can you as quickly as possible fake your product together? Give in a manual way a couple of users that experience that you envision to give your users once your product is there and just validate your business idea as quickly as possible based on that. But when you try it out with you know Facebook ads and um, Instagram ads, I definitely recommend that you focus on a small uh, geography. Yeah. So don't push out your ads across Austria, across Germany, because then you will just get you know interest from thousands of early you like people 100%. who are really geeks and who are really into it. You need a small, confined um, kind of area where, okay, my ad <clears throat> has been seen now by 20,000 people, average 20,000 people, yeah. yeah, and not just those geeks. And um, yeah, out of them, these were the metrics that we could, could get out of it, yeah. Super, super interesting. Um, some more questions. What are your most important KPIs? Um, for the consumer app, it's uh, on the one hand our acquisition, so it's, it's, it's customer acquisition, so uh, how many users do we acquire, how much do we pay for them, then it's um, on the other hand our activation rate, so how many people who downloaded our app and registered actually start scanning their receipts and looking into the impact of their purchases and the third most Third key KPI, key KPI, <laughs> KPI yeah. is key, uh, really uh, is our retention rate. So how many users are still using our app after two weeks, four weeks, eight weeks, and so on. And these are the KPIs that we're really working on, trying to improve quarter over quarter, sprint over sprint, in which are really also you need to always um, have, you know, Look at them in combination with your financial model, your unit economics. You know, you can only, in an app context, you can only acquire, or you should only acquire more users at scale once you see a payback, once you can keep them for long enough and get enough money during that time out of them so that it makes economically sense. And only from that moment on, once you have the unit economics in the right place, it makes really sense to push marketing dollars um, uh, out there and to yeah. Yeah, try to onboard more users. Data-driven decision-making. Mm -hmm. um, all right, what else have we got here? So what are you using the gather, gather data for? Um, I mean, the primary purchase is really, the primary uh, thing that we do with the, users, uh, with the user data is giving them immediate feedback. So we tell them, okay, what does your climate score look like? Yeah. We, we show you, hey, uh, if you're above 50, you basically contributed in a positive way um, to the 1.5 degree uh, goal. Um, we, we, we use the data um, to also build in gamification features like Edinoco. If you sign up, you automatically participate in the monthly raffle. And uh, what we will do is, you, when you upload a receipt, you can either win a bronze, silver or gold ticket, depending on how sustainable your purchase was. If your purchase was very sustainable, you can win back 200% of that purchase. If it was not so sustainable, we still pay you back 50% of that purchase if you are drawn. Um, so we use the data primarily to really provide feedback to our users to help them uh, to become more sustainable, to gamify the experience. And in the midterm to long term, the data topic, you know, selling um, uh, data will become uh, again interesting. What we will do then is we will offer brands insights on which uh, areas do they perform the best, do they sell the best, which other products do people buy that buy their products. Um, what do they, you know, I mean, what, what, how, what's the typical ticket of their users? Yeah. I mean, the, what's the, the, you know, the, the budget they are kind of spending. But always, again, um, in an aggregated way, we will never sell, you know, individual user data or uh, anything like that. I mean, that obviously would be, you know, would kill us if we would ever. 100%. 100%. Even, I, even I don't have access yeah. to specific user data, uh, so even I can't look up what you purchased and you know, GDPR so, is very yeah. serious right yeah. all right I'm getting indications from my team the time is over but we're gonna ask one more question that I just saw pop up in the chat because I'm very interested how did you come up with the idea for you know like what 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 made you think about this where were you, were you, you know? lot, yeah. lot, lots of alcohol no <laughs> <laughs> no it was really it was really this insight that our purchasing behavior like our food consumption 
has this massive impact, like this 70% of biodiversity loss, this 26% of the global greenhouse decisions. And then I came back home from that, from the trip to the Nordics and I decided, okay, first, if I want to do something in that space, I need to become a bit more sustainable myself. And yeah. I started an, an initiative, which I called One Change a Week. I started uh, publishing on LinkedIn, on Facebook, Instagram. Uh, every week, um, one little thing that I did to become a bit more sustainable, um, you know, like switch to renewable uh, electricity, uh, switch from um, shampoo to bars, you know, bar soap shampoos. And during that process, I realized how difficult it is to find more sustainable products because I went out to shop, bought five, you know, uh, soaps, uh, bar soaps, came back home just to realize that they were actually full of non-sustainable palm oil. It's so yeah. exactly the opposite of what I wanted to do. And this is where I really gained that insight that, you know, choosing more sustainable product is super time consuming, super complex, uh, everything else than convenient. And that there is a huge need uh, for people like myself um, to build a product that really supports in that process. Oh, super interesting. Very, very interesting, guys. I hope that you're feeling inspired. I can sit here all day and ask you my own question, <laughs> as well as all the questions I see coming up in the chat. We're sorry, guys, but time is up and my team will get mad at me if we carry on. So, Marcus, thank you very much for everything you've Thank you, you very much and good luck. Take care. Thank you, Marcus. And again, a big virtual round of applause for Marcus. Thank you so much for that. I mean, it's it's... It's inspiring to see that, you know, you really can make a change with your business ideas, right? I think for a lot of people, they think, again, business, money, it's all about just, you know, getting the most out of it for yourself, self-interest, homo economicus, as some of us have learned about. But there's more to it than that, right? We really can change the world by changing the way that business runs. We know that business is often the problem. So let's become the business people of the future and change the way we do that. Um, all right, so I want to recap a few things that, um, that Marcus spoke about, really the things that we want you to be focusing on now in preparation for Lab 2. We want you guys to take advantage of the Lean Canvas, right? This is, you know, like uh, Marcus was talking about the business model, the, the, the Lean Canvas is a way of understanding, you know, what are the various aspects that you need to dig deep into in order to build this business model um, that you want to achieve. Now, the What A Venture tool that I spoke to you guys about is an incredible way to do that. You can go step by step by step and you can actually dig deep into each of these, um, into each of these squares, you know, your customer segments, your solution, your unique value proposition. All of these are things that in the What A Venture tool, not only does it show you how to go and do that, but it gives you tools to you know, gather data, to store your data, and so on and so forth. So guys, this is something that you need to be working on, not just the big picture of your solution, but again, how can you make money? Because it's all about, a solution is about making value and about making money so that you can continue to create value and you have that, you know, that circular process. All right, so again here, make money. Another thing is to think about, what other available solutions are there, right? Look at your competitors, see if there are other people in the market doing things. And that's not always a problem, right? It means that a market exists. You could also look at the competitors and think, what can I do better based on the information that you've gathered from your potential customers, all right? And again, don't be afraid to pivot. Maybe you came into this with a certain kind of idea, a certain solution in mind, a certain problem that you want to solve. And now when you're investigating it, you find out that, that problem doesn't really exist. Another problem exists. And it's kind of like the solution you wanted, but we have to change it. Don't be scared to do that, right? That's what all fantastic, brilliant entrepreneurs do. They pivot from time to time whenever they need to. So, you know, identify a real problem and the solution that can move with that. Okay, now the next steps, guys. In a second, I just want to remind everybody that you guys who have ideas are going to be able to present on this call now. So a few people have asked about that in the chat. You guys who have ideas will be able to present. We're going to moderate it. It's going to be quick, but we'll get to that. And then we're going to create breakout rooms for you guys to chat. So just hold on tight for this. Now, I want you guys to remember um, that we're going to have, uh, we, you need to sign up, right? So sign up for the next labs, right? Take your phones out, scan the screen, um, prepare for it by logging onto the What Adventure tool, right? Conduct your customer interviews, prepare questions for your mentors. So at the next session, all right, you guys are going to be given mentors, right? Experts, entrepreneurs, business people, like I'm talking really high value people, 
all right? It's not just going to be any old person, right? It's going to be someone who time is valuable and so i want you guys to take advantage of that because you can learn a lot it's an incredible opportunity so prepare yourselves for this all right use the tools that we've given you um, access to um, and yeah and make the most of it join the idea presentation call again next week so we're going to do idea presentations now we're going to move into breakout we're going to give you guys access to breakout rooms after that all right um, but we're also going to be having an a, a a further idea presentation call one week from today. So if you don't find a team member tonight or you don't find a team member within the next week and you still need a, to find people to, to join your idea or you uh, want to find an idea to join, join the presentation call that will occur again next week, right? This is going to be on Tuesday, April 12th, right? Um, and all this information will be sent out to you. Also, again, check out the hand, handouts because all the tools that we're telling you about, there's more information. If anything was confusing, I hope that I made sense, but if it was confusing for you, right, just check those things out. All right, so it's gonna be time for you to pitch. Don't, don't unmute yourself yet, you're not actually able to. All right, um, so I got my tech team starting to prepare this. I'm gonna be bidding you guys farewell tonight and saying thank you guys very much for joining. But we are soon going to bring on Rali. Now, the way that this is going to work is that Ralitza is going to, to manage this whole setup. Rali, you can come and join me, right? Here is Rali. She's going to be taking over from me in a second. Now, what you have to do, we're going to, um, she's going to decide who pitches and she knows how that's going to work. All right. When we let you guys pitch, um, then you, if you, yeah, sorry, I got a bit confused. If you've got an idea and you pitch, and you want to have a breakout room afterwards, all right? Then you need to type into the chat room, breakout room, and the name of your idea, or your name, or whatever it is that you want people to identify you by. So you're gonna present now, but then obviously you want people to come to your breakout room. So type in the chat that you want to have a breakout room, just put BR, or breakout room, and the name that you want there to be on the breakout room, we'll set those breakout rooms up, and then, after all the pitches are done, you guys will be able to move to the breakout rooms. You can, you know, move around, roam around the breakout rooms and so on and so forth. So yeah, thank you guys for a lovely evening. It's been wonderful chatting to you. I hope you learned a lot like I did too. And I look forward to seeing what you guys have for lab too. Thank you. Good night and Raleigh. Thank you. Thank you, James. Sweet.